Kyab Su Chi. Dangi Jin So Jiba Sonangi, Trola Pinchar Sangha Drupa Sho. May all beings of happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be free from dukkha and the causes of dukkha. May they rest in joy which doesn't turn into pain. And may they learn to have equanimity equally towards Democrats and Republicans. <laughs> With Buddhist prayers, you have to slightly edit them for the audience. <laughs> Every uh, gathering in the Himalayan world begins with that simple invocation. And the idea is we can be wrong about many of our issues in our life, but as long as we wish others well and wish them uh, to be free of suffering, wish them to have joy, and wish them to learn the ways of equanimity or essentially a good human being. Beyond that, wisdom has various levels, and the great Asanga from India, the fourth, third, fourth century India, once divided the stages to enlightenment into 22 steps. But uh, the first of the 22 begins with a mind rooted in those four, love, compassion, Rejoicing, sharing joy, and equanimity. So I wasn't, uh, often when I come here, I su suggest titles, uh, and I just sort of sit down and do a divination. In the Tibetan world divination, you sit like this, uh, open your, completely empty your mind, take a deep breath, and between the in-breath and the out-breath, you roll your eyes up like this. Reminds me when I used to be married to a Jewish girl, and whenever we visit her mother, she would do that a lot. <laughs> and usually something pops up. So that's kind of the that space between the inco incoming and outgoing breath is kind of a, a vacious, vast, spacious, open state of mind. But I didn't do this. This year, uh, Venerable John suggested Bardo, Tibetan Book of the Dead, Bardo Tudal. And uh, partly because I've got two books on, um, on um, the uh, issue of Bardo and how to live and die in a noble way. And also, I think, because he knows that we're both getting older. <laughs> And we better make some preparations. <laughs> Although he'll live, I'm sure, another 40 or 50 years, and I'll make it at least another 70 or 80. <laughs> the word bardo is a big one. In Tibet, it just between two quite different states, quite different states. So in the tradition of the bardo tudal, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, it speaks about six kinds of states that we go between. The first is the bardo, between the moment of our exiting the womb and entering this world. Could also be at the moment of conception, and some people debate that kind of issue. But anyway, it's just called the bardo of birth. And it refers to the waking state from the time we're born until the time we die. And the second one is called Milam Bardo, the Bardo of sleep dreams. Because in the Bardo of sleep dreams, we're between two things. We're between one day and the next day of being awake. When we're awake, we're be awake between one day and the next day of sleep. They add to that the bardo of dying, which means the days leading up to one's death. The days <clears throat> in the, in, from the time when death starts to set in on the body and the forces of life to withdraw the senses to the energy supporting the senses and so forth. 
to withdraw. And that's between the bardo of being awake and asleep and the bardo of goodbye, happy world or cruel world, depending on which one you like. Mongolians call it this sunny world, goodbye to the sunny world. And uh, to that they add a fourth, which is the bardo of deep meditation during our <clears throat> lifetime. And deep meditation is distinctly different than being awake and walking around and being asleep and dreaming. It has its own kind of dimension of existence, you could say. It's called the bardo of samadhi or samden or jian. Uh, because in that state, we don't hear anything or see anything or smell anything, taste anything, feel anything physically. Nor do we have thoughts about the five senses. We rest in a mind beyond the sensory sphere. There are stories in India of people going into samadhi for weeks and even months on end and ants building up anthills over them. <laughs> they were in such deep meditation for such extended periods of time. Apparently ants are very good at that, and they leave just enough space for the nose for air to pass so the anthill doesn't go over, and they little, leave little holes for the eyes because the eyes need a bit of natural moisture and fresh air. Because of that, the great Indian master considered ants a special insect, the father of Mahayana Buddhism. And every day, whatever rice was left over from his lunch, he would carry it out to a local anthill and give it to the ants for being so kind <laughs> that when they build an anthill over a meditator, <laughs> they leave holes for the nose and for the eyes. And the other three are when we actually stop breathing and the energies collect. And for the first of those is clear the, the, the radiant bardo, which I think most when the West, when we hear people who have near-death experience, they speak about this tunnel of light and so on. Now, I think in the West, because during our harsh period, where if anyone showed mystical <coughs> talents, they would be uh, arrested as a heretic or a pagan or a witch, and uh, have rocks tied around them and thrown in the river, and if they drowned, they were innocent, and if they floated there, they were guilty. In which case, they were burned at the stake. So we don't have that many people who experience this clear light state anymore through meditation. Only in a natural near-death experience. It's said that if we can do samadhi, deep samadhi meditation during our lifetime, we can relax the body into a state of death simulation and give rise to this so-called mother clear light mind. Many of the great masters who die during their life, they train to rest in the clear light uh, through meditation, artificially or yogically. I guess yogically sounds better than artificially. In America, nobody likes artificial. They like yogic. I think I'll have some yogic sugar. That's uh, that uh, artificial sugar doesn't work for me. The yogic sugar is much better. In meditation, to cause the energies giving rise to that support sensory experience to withdraw or to dissolve, as it's often said. 
By doing that, they can, at the time of death, slow down the death process. For most people, going into the death process, the clear light of the moment of death happens for just a moment or two, a couple of finger snaps in length. But it's still a bardo because it's unlike any other of the other experiences in that it's this great transition between two states. So that's uh, listed as the fifth bardo. Then the sixth bardo, the bardo of becoming, which is when we leave the clear light state and enter the hereafter. Some texts refer to it as the dangerous path, paths of the bardo, because at that time we pass out of the body and look for our next reincarnation. And also, as is stated in the Bardo Tudal, liberation by hearing in the Bardo, or liberation by listening in the Bardo. Then we can achieve enlightenment in the Bardo. This clear light mind often is called clear light of death, but death is marked when the clear light of the moment of death subsides and we pass into the Bardo. That's often said like that. Therefore, Chogyan Trumpa said, please don't call it the clear light of death. Call it the clear light of the moment before death. <laughs> Nobody listened. Everyone still translates it as a clear light of death. So these six bardos are all bardo or between these other experiences. When one is happening, the others are not. The idea is like that. The, the text got the name Tibetan Book of the Dead because Evan Swentz, who was a New, New Jersey boy, uh, did his higher studies in uh, Oxford, I think at St. Michael's College. And when he was in England, the Egyptian Book of the Dead uh, became all of the rage. It was a very popular with the intellectuals of England and Europe, largely because Egypt, I think, was for Europeans one of the most uh, impressive civilizations they had encountered outside of Europe, even though by the time they discovered Egypt, it was already, the great civilization had already been dead for well over a thousand years. But nonetheless, they were deeply impressed by it. And when the, nobody could ever understand the script, and then the, the Napoleon's army boys found the Rosetta Stone in Egypt, and some bright spark was able to identify a couple of characters, and that led to the slow unraveling of the whole Egyptian script, which led to the uh, legibility of the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Because of that, and the Egyptian Book of the Dead, speaking of the hereafter and the visions and experiences and giving spiritual advice, the Oxford University Press renamed the Tibetan Book, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, rather than the Tibetan Book of Liberation through hearing or listening in the Bardo. And uh, it's still the same today. When we authors send a book to a publisher, very rarely do we get to keep the title we thought it should have. Usually a publisher has a marketing advisor, and the marketing advisor consults with the titleists for what titles would uh, appeal to the market. 
I don't know if that's the same with Quest books of Theosophical Society, but most publishers follow that policy because they think marketing analysts and titleists are much better at titles than our authors. Authors are good at like 100,000 words, but get it down to five or six words and they tie themselves up in knots. I think in general it's true. I think very few of the books I ever submitted came out with the titles that I suggested. And uh, I'm thankful they didn't in retrospect. <laughs> Sometimes they'll even go a little further and the market analyst will tell you, oh, you have to pad it out with another 25,000 words or drop 25,000 words, which we take much more seriously than coming up with a better title for us. So uh, I wanted to start, uh, have a slideshow with this because for th uh, Thursday night a party, animals like you guys, <laughs> audio-visual is all the rage. <laughs> and uh, also the subject matter lends itself very much to audio, like me speaking, and visual, like slides. Usually when I do workshops or I do meditation lectures, I don't do slides or use a visual, because I like everyone to look at me all the time. <laughs> my beautiful cheekbones, my fabulous chin, my nice Irish nose. Etc. <laughs> but uh, Bardo's okay. First slide. I wanted to uh, start with this image by Alex Gray, a friend of mine from New York, wonderful artist. If any of you go to New York, he actually has a meditation center there, as well as uh, a kind of a crystal museum for his artworks, so there, most of his artworks are housed there. When he was a younger artist, he'd sell some of the pieces, but later he just sells signed prints. It makes more money, and you get to keep the painting. But a brilliant artist and a practicing Tibetan Buddhist for many, many years. And uh, this sort of image that he did based on sort of conscious dying. The spirit leaving the body via the crown aperture at the time of death. It said that if we can open the birth, the, the, the death passage, the death channel, before we get too weak or too old, and then when we die, uh, leaving by the optimal door is a, is a great benefit. Otherwise, leaving the body from other apertures and other channels often is a... It's like having a horse race where one gets to start out a uh, hundred yards ahead or 200 yards ahead. So that leaving by the crown chakra like that has that symbolism. And to the right is a book I did a very long time ago, Living in the Face of Death, originally published in England and later picked up by an American publisher. It was one of those kind of mystical events I was leaving to go to New York for an event, for something in the mid 80s. And on the night before I flew into New York uh, and uh, flew out of India, I dreamed I was walking down a street and saw a sign blowing in the wind. And the next day I was walking down the street in London and saw the sign. And it was a book publisher. So the sign in the, in the dream didn't say publisher, it just said the name of the company. 
So I walked in and introduced myself and they said, oh, we're doing 40 books on body mind every year for the next four years or so. And we'd like to do two or three on Tibet. So what do you, let us know what you have. So I mentioned, and I always have four or five books that are like half finished. And one of them I'll be in the mood for like death and dying, because death can be fun. I'll write on for a week or two, and then I'll be in a compassion, love and compassion mood. I'll work on a different book that's more love, compassion, and something sort of emptiness and the spizzazz of Mahamudra. <laughs> work on that for a week or two until something something catches the rubber meets the road on one of them through some coincidence or other. And so in this case, it was that dream, and I told her the three or four projects the editor I was working on, and she asked to see what I had done, and I left a manuscript that was like the fourth carbon copy, so barely legible, and a mouse had eaten the bottom corner of it. <laughs> and I said, I better have this retyped before I give it to you. She said, no, no, just hand it over. I'll have it retyped. So that was nice. And it came out and then came out in, I think, French and Spanish and Portuguese of all languages. A little bit of a history of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, if you will, the original. Well, this is actually the third edition of the Evans Wentz book, but the original was published in 1927, and they weren't really thinking it would uh, become an international bestseller, but it did and sold out, and a couple of years later needed a reprint, and in the early 30s needed a third edition. And it's one of the few books from the 1920s which is still in print. And even though uh, in the middle, in the 1970s, Chogyam Trumpa worked with an American woman, Francesca Fremantle, and did a kind of a newer, updated cause, a version, because the early one by Evans Wentz is in King James English. The, thou, thus, and lots of words like that. There are plenty of verilies in it, and O oh son, and O oh my child, and things like that which for Americans tends to get on their nerves a little bit. They don't like the King James Version, most of them are of the Bible, rather than say, though thy walk through the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. They'll say, prefer a sort of, a, sort of more vernacular. Here I am cooling it in the <laughs> valley of what is it? Getting capped? <laughs> so, Trungpa and Fremantle did one in kind of a pop psychology language. But because uh, it was in kind of a pop psychology language, it also uh, in a very American pop psychology language. There was some kind of pressure to do one in a uh, good sort of New Yorker punch magazine style English, <laughs> which is what I like. And so on a, a publisher approached me to do a, a intelligently readable, fun and frolic style translation. So, <laughs> what? I said fun and frolic. <laughs> yeah, fun and frolic style Tibetan Book of the Dead. <laughs> <laughs> and so I uh, did the one on the right, and the top is the edition that came out for distribution in Asia, and the one on the bottom came out for distribution in the West. Simultaneously, because it's one of those publishers that still works by the old, old standard of if you can do something in four colors once, and do all the languages in black once, then why not print four times the copies or five times the copies in the color and just change the language ink on each printing? So they bring it out simultaneously in English and French and German and Russian and uh, a bunch of other languages. 
In terms of the idea of Tibetan Book of the Dead, the idea of what happens in human life, what happens at death, what happens between death and rebirth, and how the process of reincarnation works. This is all really based on the teachings of the Buddha in the Himalayan, in the Lama tradition, uh, and as taught in the Abhidharma. Now, basically all the teachings of Buddha are divided into three categories, and those are them at the top, the Vinaya, which is basically ethics, you could say, training in ethics. And the Sutta Pitaka, which is a training in general spirituality and often said meditation. And then Abhidharma, which is a more, you could say, philosophical and metaphysical, philosophical teachings. Sometimes it's said that the first two of those categories, categories are directly the words of the Buddha and that there are Buddhist sutras, um, in other words, records of recordings written down many years later, so they're not exactly like audio recordings or even transcriptions. <laughs> but the people thinking, I think he said this, and they write it down. And then I think, then later we say, well, we think that Ananda thought that he said that. <laughs> but anyway, it's accredited directly to the Buddha. Abhidharma is a little different in that there's, I think, seven different sections of it, and it's really people gathering things from various ideas, from bits and pieces of different discourses, and also sometimes just putting together those with other ideas that were not necessarily addressed or discussed by the Buddha, but putting them in the context of what the Buddha would say, something like that. And uh, those were transcribed in India, both in Pali and also in Sanskrit. And uh, uh, both in China and Korea. Korea has both the Tripitaka from the Pali and the Tripitaka from the Sanskrit versions from India, which is kind of rare, like uh, Sri Lanka and uh, Burma, Thailand only have the Tripitaka from the Pali versions. And Tibet only sponsored the translations of the Sanskrit versions. King Trisung Dutsen said, those are the best for us and we're not sponsoring anything else. And there's a limit to how much should a good king sponsor. <laughs> So Tibet has all has uh, transcriptions of all the Sanskrit Tripitaka and uh, Tara, so-called Theravada countries of the Pali. And, but uh, Korea has both the transcriptions from Sanskrit and the trans, uh, translations from Sanskrit and translations from Pali. In India, uh, the greatest Abhidharma master was considered to be Vasubandhu, so that's the book on the bottom. And he was the brother of the uh, Asanga who formed the mind-only school. And in the Tibetan monasteries of all Tibetan schools, they usually study uh, uh, Vasubandhu's uh, Abhidharma for uh, four or five years, some, some up to seven years. So it's considered a very serious kind of study. But all the basic, basic ideas of the Bardo Tudal come from Buddha's Abhidharma teachings uh, in that kind of way. This painting, by the way, is a Mongolian painting of Buddha. I did a book called The Flying Mystics of Tibetan Buddhism. Usually in paintings or temples, you see Buddha's two main students standing up beside him. Here, he didn't want that. He told them, take a kite. No, go fly a kite, is that it? Not take it, go fly a kite. So there they are flying up in either corner, <laughs> like kites. Um, yeah, that flying, flying mystics of Tibetan Buddhism is, uh, also was done as an art exhibit, which is why that painting was in it. And of course, the a sort of a what do you call pie pie chart? <laughs> I, 
a pie chart of the reincarnation process. I never knew that word pie chart until Ross Perot ran for president in the second election of uh, George H. Bush, the senior. And somehow he got 19% of the vote <laughs> and stole it from poor old H, who was kind of a shoe in and uh, gave it to Clinton, which of course after that, before that, none of the Democrats liked Ross Perot for running very much. But once he took 19% of the vote and handed the election to Clinton, his popularity greatly rose with Democrats, greatly dropped with Republicans. <laughs> but uh, just looking at two different close-ups this is kind of the inner workings of life, death, and reincarnation. At the center of the chart, the three animals, the snake, the, ch the rooster, and the pig, each chasing one another in circles, representing the three root klesha, or three root delusions that afflict humans and keep them running in circles. Sangsara is called, often this is called the pie chart of samsaric <laughs> evolution, going round and round in circles. But because of our not understanding nature of self, ignorance, and this is uh, manifest first as sort of attachments and cravings to things that we think support the false self that we imagine, and then next develop into a kind of aversion to the those factors that kind of threaten our sense of self, our fabricated sense of self. And because of that, we come to the next circle. The negative side can pull us down and the light side on the left can pull us up. So on the bottom of the right is sort of like a demon pulling everyone down, meaning the demon of anger, the demon of craving or desire and the grieving de demon of ignorance, pulling people down to darkness. And on the other side, side, at the top, a kind of a sage pulling everyone up to the realm's higher being and rebirth. And then on the outside, the six realms, the hells and the ghosts and the animals and the humans and the asuras and the devas. So a Tibetan book of the talks that if we achieve enlightenment in this lifetime, then this wheel of this thing of we break there, at the center we break ignorance of the nature of self. When we break ignorance of the nature of self, we, we cut off the habit of craving, grasping, desire, and so forth. And when that's cut off, then anger, aversion, fear becomes cut off. And when that happens, we achieve enlightenment. So that's the meaning of being dragged up and being dragged down. Until then, we sort of go up and down on these six realms. And some uh, Buddhists take these six realms to be sort of psychological states. The hells are when you're in a state of anger or fear and when you are environmentally surrounded by violence. And the ghost realm is when you're in a state of poverty, either physically or mentally, and always have total greed and totally unable to satisfy, have a sense of satisfaction. Often in paintings, I don't know if you can see them here, they're shown as beings with very big bodies and very small necks. <laughs> and sometimes even their neck is tied in a knot, which makes for an artistic contortionist kind of a in the Barnum and Bailey time, the times they would have had a job in the circus. <laughs> but uh, the idea is it doesn't matter how much your desire is, you can never get enough past the knot in your neck <laughs> to feel satisfaction. And animals sort of represents living by instinct rather than living, being directed by wisdom. Humans in a negative state represent a kind of a narcissistic human, where we use our intelligence and our bigger brain basically for hoarding things and uh, selfish endeavors. 
The Asuras represent beings who are uh, very successful, the low, so-called lower gods, very successful, but they always want more, 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 more. And then the Devas represent those who have everything and very complacent and very kind of apathetic towards the rest of the world. And so they just basically spend their good times and good wealth and good resources on sort of worldly comforts and worldly happinesses. But then when their time runs out, they fall like shooting stars. So that's the pie chart of reincarnation. So in India, that was uh, early Buddhist India. Now we say the reincarnation in Buddhism, we say, isn't just a matter of faith. Great Indian masters like uh, Dharmakirti wrote, uh, wrote logic treatises or supporting the logic of reincarnation. And it's also said if you meditate deeply, you can generate clairvoyance, wherein you can remember your previous lives. And if none of you have that ability, if you pay me a thousand dollars, I'll look deep in your eyes and tell you who you were in your previous life. For some of you, if you have a very obscured previous life, the cost is double. <laughs> So India had that basic idea throughout all schools of Buddhism in India. Some people who ask me what's the best sort of logical support for the theory of reincarnation, I tell them to read Plato and the Socrates uh, dialogues. And especially there's one dialogue where Socrates defends why he is an adherent of the doctrine of reincarnation. And Plato, of course, endorses that himself by recording it and stating it very strongly in his writings. And in India, of course, uh, Buddhism developed into a number of schools because India was a very huge continent. Sometimes we call it the subcontinent. But it, although it was unified briefly under King Ashok, about 250 BC or 100 or so years, 150 years after the Buddha, uh, in fact, it was never unified in a cultural way. Each of, the king, each of the kingdoms kept a king and so on. And within a century and a half or two centuries, uh, the Ashokan Empire became like a Brexit, Europe with Brexit that they, they one by one sort of went their own separate ways. So the, as Buddhism traveled through those many lands and was in many different languages, it took on many different shapes and forms. And uh, um, those grew in certain aspects of those grew stronger in certain regions. And North India, in particular, took a deep liking to Tantric Buddhism. And uh, Tantra is really a, a unification of all of the different trends of Buddhism, you could say, but in something like a mystical theater way of combining them. Mystical theater is very big in Tantra. And in about 750 AD, this great master here, Padmasambhava, was one of the greatest of the Indian masters of that century, came to Tibet and uh, taught uh, Tantric Buddhism widely in Tibet. Of course, Buddhism had already, and Tantric Buddhism had already been the national religion of Tibet for 150 years at that time. So when it's said that Padmasambhava brought Buddhism to Tibet, it's a bit of an exaggeration. Uh, but he was the one who made it most um, stabilized, I guess you would say, really established. Before that, most Dharma teachers in Tibet were imported from India, Nepal, Pakistan, Khotan to the north, or China to the east, or Mongolia to the northeast. And uh, Padmasambhava established sort of the first indigenous training ground training 
retreat center or monastery or whatever you want to call it. Not all, everyone in it was a monk. So if you say monastery, it's a little misleading. In Tibetan, the word is chude, which means dharma, dharma institute, something like that. And he led it, set up a 12-year retreat on this mountain, which is up behind the monastery that he established, or the Dharma Institute that he established. 25 of them achieved enlightenment. So they're known as the 25 Siddhas, or accomplished masters of Chimpo. For my flying mystics, I was able to get this painting of like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine of them. <laughs> We're missing 16. <laughs> Anyway, there were 25. The one at the statue at the top is the statue of Padmasambhava, that's in Semye, in Tibet at the moment, where Padmasambhava built the, his uh, monastery there. The one below is from Mongolia. And it's made from 10,000 knives. Because <laughs> when uh, halfway between uh, Mongolia and Beijing, the capital of Mongolia and capital of uh, China, there's a stop in the Gobi with a high lama. And at one point, some travelers were knifed to death passing through that area. So he requested every household to give him one iron knife or a steel knife. And so they all did. And he took all the knives and melted them down and had them cast into that statue of Padmasambhava. And thus the what the murder of those two travelers was transformed into an image of a Buddha. So Padmasambhava is often known as the second Buddha, literally a second Buddha, but there's no uh, specific article in uh, Sanskrit or Tibetan. So it's Nagarjuna is often referred to as the second Buddha or a second Buddha. Sometimes Atisha is referred to that and Padmasambhava to that, and Sankapa also is referred to as a second Buddha. The institute he established in the mountain behind where those 25 achieved enlightenment. And this led to the Turton tradition, those 25 taking rebirth. Uh, with many of them, they were given instructions in future lives to reveal various hidden or secret teachings of Padmasambhava. That led to us known as the treasure tradition of, in Tibetan Buddhism. And sometimes the treasure texts and sometimes treasure articles. Uh, um, what else are there? And sometimes they're discovered in dreams and sometimes in meditation. Sometimes they're just found in a cave somewhere or, or inside a stupa or inside a statue like that, hidden in various ways. Bay ter, gong ter, uh, milam terma. Those are the three main Hidden in meditation and whatnot. The one at the top on the very right is the previous to the prejum dujum rinpoche, dujum lingpa, who's become very popular in the West because Alan Wallace uh, has started translating some of his books. So the guy was very wild kind of character. And whenever he'd do death and consciousness, he was a chain smoker and he had one of, he died in 1903, and had one of those very long Betty Grable kind of uh, cigarette holders. And when he'd be invited to someone's house to do a consciousness transference, in other words, to throw their consciousness out the crown aperture, he'd come in and put out his cigarette on their head He'd light a cigarette and smoke it, and he'd blow the smoke over them as kind of offering. And then he'd put out the cigarette on this point, and then he'd do the consciousness transference ritual. This weekend, we're doing a POA training. Are we allowed to smoke in this institute? Am I allowed to do, uh, do that on your head, John? Not on my head. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, he was one of the great treasure revealers and his, the texts that he wrote. Now, with the treasures, these guys don't attribute the texts to themselves. They attribute them to Padmasambhava. Even though Padmasambhava only appeared to them in a dream and spoke them in a dream or 
appeared to them in a when they were meditating and spoke to them in a meditation, or told them in a dream or in meditation, go to that cave and look three rocks behind the center and dig a little hole down there and you'll find a casket with blah, blah, blah in it. So, all of the, so there's 108 of these, but they're all usually considered to be reincarnations of those 25 from the mountain. And the first to become very famous in the West was this guy, Karma Lingpa, who was the man who wrote the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And below uh, is a, a Mongolian edition of the Tibetan Book of the Dead written at the top in Tibetan and in the middle in the sort of little dribbling. This is called the standing script, but it should be called like the dribbling script because they start from the top and they kind of dribble down. That was devised during Genghis Khan's time and remained the official language of Mongolia and all Mongolian, all 10 Mongolian nations until uh, I think it was 1942 or something like that when uh, Stalin told them all they had to learn Cyrillic. So now they're doing Cyrillic. And then you can take and write them in under there very small in English, if you like, with your fine ballpoint pen. But that's Karmalingpa at the top, painting of him. Often Mahasiddhas are shown with tigers like that because when they walk around, wild animals like to walk with them as their friends. And down on this side, down here, shown more in the form of Guru Rinpoche. And on the top is a modern edition of his Karma Lingpa Shitro. He wrote many hundreds of books. Tibetan Book of the Dead it was one of a set of six that he wrote called Liberation Upon. <laughs> so this is Liberation in the Bardo. He also wrote one which is like just a sign you hang above your door. And this is a liberation on seeing. So just seeing that thing hanging over your door brings you enlightenment. May take a while to work in. It's like one of those sort of Monty Python jokes that takes you four or five years. Then you're driving down the street and suddenly it hits you and you start laughing uncontrollably and lose control of the car and crash into a tree and kill yourself. <laughs> anyway, I hung one over, over my door. I didn't notice any instant change, but I guess that's because I was already enlightened. <laughs> yeah. Ram Das says about that, about his Indian teacher. When he went to visit him in Nimkaroli Baba, when he went to visit him in India, he gave him some purple heart LSDs. And Nimkaroli Baba took two or three of them and nothing changed. So Baba Ramdas thought this must mean Nimkaroli Baba is already an acid head. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I had that experience with liberation by seeing above my door. <laughs> But the, the, the cycle of Shitro is a cycle of mandalas and yogic meditation with both generation stage and completion stage. So generation stage means practicing a mandala where you invoke yourself as a Buddha form and um, all around you everyone as Buddhas and always in a kind of a wrathful or a desire, desirous kind of look. And the world is tantric theater. And in the completion stage, doing the five stages of Chandali or Kundalini, and then illusory body practice and clear light yoga and so on. So he wrote a whole cycle of Shitro. And his Tibetan Book of the Dead is based on that. So to understand Tibetan Book of the Dead very deeply, you have to understand the uh, uh, Shitro language and symbolism to a certain extent. About five, six years ago, 
Rubin Museum in New York did a Bardo Tibetan Book of the Dead uh, exhibit, and they invited a bunch of speakers to give talks there during the during the time of the exhibit, and I was one of the ones who was greatly honored to be amongst the august assembly. <laughs> Though all of us felt underpaid. <laughs> Overly honored, but underpaid. <laughs> I was recently up in Canada, and I was playing cribbage with some of my cousins. And one of the ladies was mentioning one of the professors from the local university who was going to England and had been to give lectures, some lectures at Oxford and what a great honor it was. And I pointed out, I did that two or three summers ago. Great honor, underpaid. <laughs> but anyway, the Shitro is, is a set, those set of mandalas. These are the two mandalas in particular. Shitro means, Shitro literally means peaceful and wrathful. It means uh, peaceful and wrathful, hundred peaceful and wrathful deities. Coming out of the Shitro in a very simple form is the Buddhas of the six realms. So when we enter the Bardo, if we look at the Shitro mandala, it talks about seven weeks, which is based on the Buddhist Dharma, and each of those seven weeks of the Bardo being a cycle here the meaning really is that consciousness has seven dimensions. And those seven dimensions uh, sort of slowly unwind in the bardo. Each of the seven offers an opportunity for enlightenment. And uh, the language is always, don't look at this, don't look at that. Notice how everything you experience is an emanation of your own mind, a projection of your own mind. And in life, we're in... If you practice the Shitra Mandala in life, you're told the same thing. Notice how everything that you experience is really your own projection. Of course, something's there, but the way we experience it is through the filter of our projection, something like that. And if we pass through the cycle of the peaceful deities of the seven days, it really means a kind of the female quality of our unwinding which is more gentle and more specific and more radiant, more connected to beauty. Then we come to the second, which is more connected to the male side of our nature, which is more aggressive and more violent, and therefore the visions become aggressive and violent. And then it goes on from there and goes down through another couple of sevens, couple of cycles of seven and then comes to the, when we're ready for rebirth. So then the application is closing the door to rebirth so as to stay in the bardo a little bit longer, so as not to be thrown out, but by to leave at your own free will, <laughs> and possibly to avail yourself of that subtle state for enlightenment. So there are the Buddhas of the six realms, the Buddha who sits in the hells, sort of uh, helping people who are a little bit violent and sits in the ghost realms helping people who are a little bit attached and sits in the animal realms uh, um, helping the instinctual types and sits in the uh, human realm helping the narcissists and sits in the asura realm the uh, violently jealous types and in the deva realms the sort of pacific pacific apathetic types and to, right, to the right, we see a mandala, similarly with Padmasambhava up in the corner, with Avalokiteshvara in the center, the Buddha of compassion, re representing how those six Buddhas are an emanation of compassion, or the Buddha of compassion. Each of those uh, seven days starts with a manifestation of connected to one of the six Buddhas. In other words, first to our kind of anger, and secondly to our sort of... Uh, craving and so on. So each of them has a kind of a positive and a negative side that we have to work through and find the balance. <laughs> but one of my books is called uh, From the Heart of Shenrezi and one of the yogas in it is the Bardo Yoga taught in the six yogas of Niguma. Also in the chapter on Shenrezi there's a 
chapter on how the Bardo Yoga is practiced. So generally, to be, as, as Karma Lingpa says in the introduction to the Bardo Todal, if you uh, succeed in tantric practice in your life, you can easily succeed at the Bardo Yogas in the Bardo. If you don't, you're better to do Poa. If you are not an adept in tantric practice, better to do Poa at the time of death, sort of forceful pre transference of consciousness out of your body directly to a higher state. So that sort of represents that. Wanted to include a photo of my own guru, Ling Rinpoche, from whom I received so many of my tantric teachings. On the left is after he passed away, he was mummified, and I was one of the models used for his mummification. Not for his face, though. And uh, in Tibet, all of the Gandan Trippas were mummified, head of Kalupas, and so they were all destroyed by the Chinese, so he was the first one to die in exile. And so he was mummified. My other great guru and tantric teacher, Krabji Tijan Doji Chang, and both of them, when they died, entered Tukdam. Often when great masters like that die, if they're not, if they're not uh, mummified, then they're cremated in a stupa style cremation pyre like this. And then a stupa is built for them and all the relics put inside the stupa for future generations to walk around and collect merit. So in the ancient times, the stupa was largely a relic casket, you could say. This is a, one of the eighth Dalai Lama, and his mummy is inside that in the Potala. And finally, if we achieve enlightenment in this lifetime, okay, otherwise we do poa, and uh, at the time of dying, project to one of the Enlightenment paradises, as they're called. The two main ones with Tibetans are most famous ones. Tibetan with popular is Sukhavati on the left and Akanista on the right. To succeed in life and to succeed in death, three qualities, compassion, wisdom, and confidence. We need those three. Confidence or competence, one of those two. And the, one of the most beautiful Buddha of Compassion paintings I ever encountered was in St. Petersburg in a hermitage, which was a museum established by Catherine the Great, and that collected some of the most wonderful Buddhist art over the next centuries, and has a fabulous, fabulous collection, including this 11th century Tonka, perhaps the oldest existing Shenrezi painting, because often Tonkas being on cloth don't last so well. But I had the good fortune to be inside a stupa in the middle of the Gobi where it never rains <laughs> for about 800 years. And then uh, something happened, maybe someone blew it up or something, but anyway, out it came and someone took it to her and offered it to her as a gift and it went in the hermitage. And I, always put, I always put something at the end that'll jar my tongue into silence. <laughs> <laughs> because we should speak for an hour and leave a half hour or so for chit chat. This is a question that somebody wrote in. Do actions of persons in the bardo beyond death of the body generate karmic consequences? Say that one more time. Do actions of persons oh. in the bardo beyond death of the mm -hmm. body generate karmic consequences? Uh, the subject of karma is a very profound one in the sense that karma means our interconnectivity to all things, past, present, and future. And so... You could say my karma at the moment is everything that brought me to this point and that brought about every, uh, every condition in my life. So karma in Buddhism means a kind of a flow of energy or flow of activity. And so that flow of activity, that flow of energy is always there manifesting through all 
areas of our life. When we're alive, obviously we have, we have some kind of thinking process which is a little different than when we're and awake than when we're, say, asleep and in a dream. And it'll be a little different than we're, when we are in an after-death body. But we're still part of that process of having the sense of past, present, and future and being in a state of change. So the long, the, the long and the short is karma is everywhere in the universe at all times and in all states to one extent or another. Our mental presence affects the intensity, I would say. But otherwise, certainly, yes, karma is there in the sense that whatever we do has a consequence. Tibetans very rarely say karma, just like that. Le. They often they say, le gyutre, karma, cause and effect. In other words, what we do at the present moment, to a certain extent, uh, affects the next moment. Like, for instance, right now, if I tell something funny, people would laugh. <laughs> the consequence of the action of telling a joke is a few people laugh, some people giggle, and some people think, is that really funny? <laughs> or if you say something rude or insulting, someone gets angry. That's karma, cause and effect. Now we can talk about instant karma, in that what we do right now has an instant effect, and we can also talk about long-term rollouts from that. You know, if you hit one pool ball on a busy pool table, it hits one thing, and then that hits another one, and that hits another one, and suddenly all the pool balls are in motion. It may look like they're all random, but a perfect mathematician could sit down there and sit down and judge the point at which each ball was sitting and say where everyone was going to go. It's just a simple matter of calculation. So in that way, everything we always do has some impact. And even if we're in our sleep and we dream, it has an impact. If we respond to our dream with fear, it becomes a more fearful dream, and then a more fearful dream, and a more fearful dream. And the same with other types of dreams. In the Tibetan tradition and the Buddhist tantric tradition, we say it's important if you want to succeed at bardo yoga, like the Tibetan Book of the Dead yoga, you should first train in dream yoga when you're alive, because the dream body and bardo body are very similar. And because they're very similar, the way you affect your dream state with your yoga or your meditation or whatever you want to call it, your, your conscious engagement, is the same way that conscious engagement in the bardo affects things. Therefore, the bardo, Tibetan Book of the Dead, is not really so much describing what's happening in the bardo, although some people read it like that, but what's important is the advice for how to respond to the various kinds of fearful or alluring visions that arise, the same as they do in our dreams. So in that sense, yes, uh, karma is every, every bit as much at play in any and every state that we've, in which we find ourselves. Because lately I've been thinking over the concept of karma. It, from the perspective of attachment to the concept of karma. So in other words, I totally agree that karma is cause and effect, and that's exactly what it means. You and mean you're very attached to the idea that karma is cause and effect? Well, no, no, that's not what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> but often people... It sounded like that to me. Did it no, sound like no, that to you guys? No, no, that's not what I meant. Yes, I see a lot of people nodding yes. <laughs> Karma is cause and effect, that's it. But people 
um, project things onto karma and make all these judgments about karma. And, oh, they're getting... What, uh, of what, who are these people? Of what people Buddhists, are you speaking? Of, for like instance, these people Buddhists, in this room? Yes, many Buddhists I've known. Anyone in this room? You're many Buddhists Buddha? I've known. And they get very <laughs> judgmental about other people's karma. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, yes, definitely. But, but I think... Uh, <laughs> so I, I think karma becomes a heavier um, burden for people who are attached to some kind of conceptual idea of it being good and bad. Mm. And then I believe it's... Well, really, there's, we talk, uh, Buddhism talks about two kinds of karma that are important, zakchegile, which is uh, karma which is distorted, as long as we don't have um, authentic understanding of our own true nature or the self, everything we do is done on the basis of misunderstanding. It's done on the basis of a distortion. So we can go out and save 10,000 lives, but it's still a distorted karma because our understanding of the nature of the self is distorted. Otherwise, most people would think saving 10,000 lives is a good thing to do. Or we can go out and murder 10,000 people. <laughs> and most people would say that's not a very nice thing to do. So most people talking about karma would say that's a little bit negative karma. But it's equally a distorted karma. Who knows if it's worse or best. When we say something is good or something's bad, it's only from a particular perspective. That's why Nagarjuna said there is no good, there is no bad. Good and bad is always in relationship to something. So it's always a contextual good and a contextual bad. Like, for instance, uh, World War I, there's the famous story of an Allied soldier who had Hitler as a young man in his sights and could have shot him. And he just was getting tired of the war, and it was near the end of the war, and both sides knew it was near the end of the war, so they're all just being more casual, and nobody was shooting that much because they knew armistice was coming in a couple of weeks. So he didn't shoot them. Some people would say, that's good. Some people would say, whoops, big mistake, because <laughs> Hitler went on to well, create many deaths. So these things of good and bad are kind of relative to a particular judgment call. And uh, similar, when Hitler was a young man, he was out swimming and he started drowning and someone hopped in to bail him out and later said, wish I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> so these kind of things are there. That's why we say good karma, bad karma in the mind of someone who has a strong sense of self, other, and particular kind of structural structural mechanism. Um, so I think the main issue with karma in Buddhism isn't whether it's good or bad, although one can make a point from the book, make that emph emphasis on good behavior, not harming others and trying to be nice to others. One can make that point and all kings and social leaders have always encouraged people. <laughs> But as teachers, to stress that a little, like don't kill, don't steal, don't rob, that sort of thing. But uh, whether or not anything, all of those things are good or bad, always depends. You can look at it in a long, short term. Doing something nice feels good for both sides. In the long run, who knows? You know, so it's so. In Buddhism, the more important one is zakchegile and zakmegile. Zak the kind of way the transformations take place in our day-to-day -day digestion of our experience. I mean, every moment we're sort of meeting a new world and completely absorbing it through the five senses. Meeting it and absorbing it through the five senses, we process it in, a, in some particular, very specific kind of way. And that impacts our own understanding, our own life, the lives of those with whom we interact. And for that reason, the, the distorted sense of self becomes a 
main issue, a bigger issue than if something seems good or something seems bad. So a zakmegile is one who achieves higher wisdom than based on and sort of you could say clairvoyance, something like that. What one does can be much more meaningful. So in that way, yes. But I think karma is probably the best teaching Buddha gave uh, because it's very important that people have the sense of self-responsibility and that one's personal efforts make a big difference in one's life. And I think that's the main issue, the main way in which Buddha taught karma, the so-called Four Noble Truths of unhappiness and its causes and freedom and its causes. A lot of our unhappiness and a lot of our happiness, a lot of our success or a lot of our sufferings come about through the way we process the moments and days of our life and the way we deal with friends and relatives and lovers and husbands and wives and so forth. So I think that's a key people understanding I'm not like an innocent bystander in the theater of my life. That's why Buddha said, freedom is in your hand. If you grab it, you got it. But if you don't grab it, nobody's going to give it to you. In other words, someone can talk about karma, but unless you take responsibility for your own transformations and the way you experience them, then it's just going to be a kind of a, a philosophy, like uh, the earth is round or the earth is flat. I mean, everyone knows the earth is flat, but we should believe it's round. So we'll go along with that. Correct? I think uh -huh. one of the most important spiritual truths, and it's in one of your books, I don't remember which one, I think the one about... I don't know. The sec Did you write a book about the second Dalai Lama? Two. Two, okay. So I think that's what the one is. But I think the 14th Dalai Lama is quoted in that introduction, talking about the second Dalai Lama and how much he admired him. And the main reason he admired him was for his incredible open-mindedness. And I think mm -hmm. that... Um, you know, open-mindedness kind of underlies all these, th con all the things that come out and that you have to absorb and kind of work through and figure out. And, you, and it, it's it's kind of about never being in a, a fixed and static, stuck mm -hmm. place. All right, sure. Yeah. And that affects karma. You know, usually. and second Alam also says the conceptual mind is the biggest obstruction to enlightenment, getting locked in a kind of a think tank rather than an experiential life. In other words, you overthink things and you don't engage them or feel them enough. Another friend of mine once at a conference said, uh, with with Western, with in the East, when we talk about discipline and morality, usually we mean our own ethical behavior in the West, when we talk about it, usually we're looking at others. <laughs> and the Kadampas once said, easier to notice uh, one mis a hundred mistakes in others than a one in yourself. So I think that's always there with people. Anyway, thank you for that question. So my understanding of karma is that motivation is key. So it's less what you do than the reason you do it. I mean, if you're, if you're going around doing good deeds because you want people to admire you, that's mm -hmm. far less admirable than doing a good deed because it needs to be done. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering what you're, what you well, have in to the, say about that. Yeah, in the Tibetan world, uh, Mahayana world, we say there's two things to be done, one before and one after. Before is to develop the motivation of love and compassion for all beings. And whatever you do, to do it on the basis of love and compassion. And secondly, at the end of it, to think any benefits from it I dedicate to the happiness of all the world. 
and uh, may all beings become more wise. So I think one reason why that's said, again, it's got, got to do with these two sides of karma, the zakche and the zakme. Until we understand nature of self, where something that's good is just done from an appearance of duality. So, like for instance, in a, in your dream, if you feed a dog, does it really is it really an act of great merit? I mean, it didn't cost you a penny, <laughs> just some dream food. So, same in our waking state, we don't really know is it what's exactly what's going on. It's like that Zen saying: "I went to sleep, dreamed I was a butterfly, woke up, now I'm a man. Am I a butterfly dreaming a man that I'm a man, or a man dreaming I'm a butterfly?" So until we understand nature, until we develop the wisdom of the nature of self or the nature of mind or true nature, samgirangshin, the nature of being, everything we do is kind of provisional, you could say. I'm not really sure what's going on, but nonetheless, I don't want to hurt this dream dog or this dream person. I would like to help that person because they're looking a little bit miserable over something. So Dalai Lama always likes to say, at least give people smiles in, in your, when you encounter them. That, and that, that already is kind of the right direction. Yeah, so what you say is very true. You know, that uh, motivation makes it very different, makes a big difference on whether something is positive or negative. For instance, fishermen put a worm on a hook and offer it as food to the fish. Now, uh, kids go to the park and throw in food for the fish. Both of them offer food to the fish. But the, the, the feel-good side is very different from the kids. They just get the feel-good side of seeing the fish eating and being happy and excited. And the fisherman, he gets the thrill of murdering a fish. Assassination, fish style. <laughs> in Tibet, all fish were protected by law. No fish assassinations allowed. <laughs> but then China came, uh, communists, and invaded, and they're uh, enthusiastic fishermen. So when you first went to Tibet, you could walk up to a stream and put your hand in and bump three or four fish. They wouldn't, they wouldn't run away when they heard a human footstep because they knew those guys might be bringing some food or the whatever. They would never think, here comes an assassin. From my understanding, the, the Bardo is somewhat of a dreamlike realm in which you're trying to achieve lucidity. And it seems if reincarnation is true, then this life is like the afterlife of a life we've already lived. So I was wondering if the life that we're currently in isn't an extension of the bardo state. Yeah, as I said in the beginning, it's one of the six bardos. So all of them are called bardos for that reason. They're, they all have a dreamlike quality. If that's true, then what separates, why the emphasis on compassion if the people around us are as imaginary as the wrathful or peaceful deities? Because uh, we don't know they're really imaginary. Like, for instance, if someone punches imaginary you in, the, in your imaginary nose, and you fall down, and then they jump on your head four or five times with steel boots, even though they may be imagining it, you'll still feel some... They'll, they'll still get a sense that you have a feeling of discomfort. So the problem isn't really so much what's really going on, because until we achieve a deeper... And still one achieves deep wisdom, there's always some distortion of what's going on. But uh, nonetheless, for instance, I may be an illusory being. So the seventh Dalai Lama put it in a poem. I planned to read one tonight, but then the lights were down. And my 36-year-old eyes are not once they were when I was 16. <laughs> but in it he says something like, uh, illusory beings 
perform illusory deeds in a world of illusion, but nonetheless they do them with Dharma mind, uh, because um, the illusion of Dharma works well with the illusion of the living beings. And I think that's uh, that really catches the point that it seems like I exist in the way I think of myself, and if someone treats me badly, it hurts. Therefore, others who also have an illusory-like quality, if someone treats them badly, it hurts. If someone treats them well, it feels nice for them. And if I treat others nicely, it feels nice for me. Once when I was in New York City, I don't know, 20 years ago, I was giving a talk at uh, the Tibet, office of Tibet, to a group of their patrons. And afterwards, we walked down the street, and this beggar came up. And the guy, the person I was walking with said, oh, dang, there's so many beggars these days. So I reached in my pocket, and I gave the guy 20 bucks. And he, like, just jumped about 10 feet in the air and started singing and dancing and just became as happy as a lark. And immediately my friend, who was looking a bit grumpy about this person, started being very happy that this person had become so happy. And I think whether it's illusion or not is not so much the issue as what is illusory about it. Things don't exist in the manner of their appearance, but they still have that illusory appearance. So that's what the that's what the issue becomes. This is kind of an unusual question. Could it have been Hitler's karma to unify Germany and the rest? I suppose the lords of karma are the only ones who really understand the process. Yeah, it's always dangerous in modern modern world to say anything about Hitler, because everyone has a very touchy opinion <laughs> on the guy. I was once watching a very interesting documentary, which call, was called World War II, The Warlords, about an hour and a half documentary on World War II, and the way Roosevelt... Churchill, Hitler, and Stalin were all trying to figure out what the other was thinking, and them all trying to dupe the other into thinking that one of the others was thinking something they weren't thinking in order to cause them to make a misdeed. And that, in fact, Hitler's invasion of Russia was completely, uh, what you call it, a snow job. That Roosevelt and... Uh, Churchill invited Stalin to send a representative to London to make it seem like England. And because at the time Hitler thought already World War II was won, there was no more war to be had. He had treaties with England, he had treaties, you know, he conquered Europe, he had treaty with Russia, so everything seemed okay. And uh, all he had to do was sort of work on England a little bit to soften up and give him a nice treaty and maybe he'd let France go or something like that. So that was kind of his thinking. And meanwhile, Churchill is like, we don't want to let that guy go. We have to stomp him. He's too dangerous and his war machine is too big. And plus, he's very un-British. And Roosevelt, meanwhile, was like quite cozy with Stalin and quite confident that he could cause Stalin to become a sort of a democratic party leader and have fixed elections at least. And so it's very interesting. And it has all the correspondence between like their secretaries and their generals on these kind of what they're thinking and how they're trying to, you know, they could have used a clairvoyant in there to <laughs> work this out. And uh, anyway, Churchill was able to completely snow job him into attacking Russia, which was the last thing he wanted to do because they lost World War I because of a war on two fronts. And he had purposely crafted a treaty with Russia to avoid that. I mean, certainly a spin-off 
of the world of World War II was the creation of Israel and a spin-off of his policy on you know, extermination of Jews uh, was the creation of Israel. So if you want to say that's his karma, it's certainly his part of that picture, part of that process. He doesn't play the role of a guy riding a white horse and wearing a white hat in it. <laughs> that's for sure. He had, he had some, he certainly had some uh, darkness about him. I never like to say too much bad about him because my dad joined World War II in order to fight the Nazis. And because of that, he met my mom. So without Hitler and World War II, there would be no me, at least bearing the name Mullen. <laughs> Can you tell me about the beads? Oh, yes, yes. I sell these for $3,000. <laughs> For you, for you, 2,500. <laughs> In India, they like to use this. They call them mantra mala. And you play with them. Dalai Lama likes to do his like this when he's teaching. You keep them nice and warm. And if you, you forget, someone asks a question where you're a little in doubt of the answer, you go like this a few times and the mantra spins, spins out energy into your arms and it goes through your whole body and it comes up to your brain and sends signals to your tongue and you give the wisest answer on the planet. Pass those puppies over. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 2,000. For you, just 2,000. <laughs>